2018, and then he later resigned from his chaplaincy in order to be free to speak out and defend what he sees as the integrity of the Christian faith. And I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Gavin Ashenden joins me now. Hello, Dr. Gavin. Can I call you uh, Gavin, if that's OK? Oh, yes, please, please do. Yes. Wonderful. And thank you very much for having me on your show. Nice to meet you. No, it's a pleasure. And so nice to, to meet you as well. I can imagine you're probably quite busy today. Are you, are you busy today, seeing as it's Easter Monday? Well, I am, but only because I'm, I'm pleased to say that people allow me to write for their ma magazines and articles. So I've got a, a newspaper article, a magazine article and a podcast to get ready. So I'm, I'm busy avoiding the housework by doing that. Fabulous. Fabulous. Good, good job. Yes. Avoid the house at all costs, unlike you. <laughs> so, so, Gavin, talk me through, because there's been some controversy that has surrounded uh, your, your career. Can you talk me through some of, some of that controversy? Yes. It's, it's, if you're right in the middle of the storm, it's not entirely um, obvious sometimes what the most important things are. But I think probably um, in the early 1980s, I used to smuggle Bibles inside the Soviet Union. And I got to know the persecuted church there. People were sent to to, to prison camp, they were treated as insane if they believed uh, and repudiated Marxist dogma. Um, and I was uh, arrested by the KGB and interrogated. And so I got a sense of what totalitarianism looked like from the inside. And I was amazed when the wall came down in 1989. So when, when the millennium turned and it became it, it slowly became clear that there was some kind of totalitarianism growing in the West. I, I was as surprised as I was determined to try and do something about it. But it's come on us very slowly and rather oddly in a different direction. Um, no, no tanks, uh, no KGB, but instead cancellation and a kind of mass psychosis. So there was that on the one hand. I, I always had the sense that if you described our civilization as a kind of wrestling ring, in the middle of the wrestling ring, you'd have uh, Jesus, Marx and Mohammed. Um, and in, in, in these latest decades, it's as almost as if Marx and Mohammed or the representations of Islam and, and political correctness have ganged up against Jesus. Uh, and then when they got rid of Christianity, there'll be a a showdown between the two of them. Um, so it seems to me that one of the things we have to do is to try and articulate um, what the struggle's for and, and why it matters. And I think one of the reasons I'm a Christian is because I'm very impressed with the way that, that Christianity defends um, the sanctity of human life, freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. I think without those things, you have very different societies. And I, I, don't, I don't see in either... Uh, Islam or else in Marxism, those values being celebrated or guarded. Mm. Uh, now, for, for your career, so talk to me about your career up to sort of 2008 when you were appointed a chaplain um, to the Queen. Well, it's very simple, really. A pretty pretty non-entity-ish. I, uh, I trained as a lawyer to begin with because I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to make law more accessible to the population. Once when I was a, a law student, the little old lady who sold me milk was in tears. And when I asked her what, what the matter was, she said she was being evicted by her landlord. And I said, I'm, I'm a law student. He can't do that. And she said, my kind can't get lawyers. So on the spot, I said, can I be your lawyer? And I'm afraid I behaved very badly. I invented a fictitious uh, firm of lawyers that didn't exist. And I wrote, I wrote letters to the landlord uh, until I got him off her back. And then I thought, this is so important we should be able to to give legal help to people at the bottom of the heap who need it. But of course, the, the legal profession wasn't so easily reformed. And I, I became a priest. Uh, and then I was a vicar for 10 years in, in Bermondsey in southeast London, uh, when it was uh, fairly poor and run down. And then for seven years on a South Croydon housing estate. Um, uh, but I've always been a sort of intellectual monkey with the emphasis on monkey. And I I, I got a clutch of degrees together, including a PhD, and got a job at university where I, I taught and was a chaplain for 25 years. So, now, so how did you then sort of see your way into becoming um, working with, as a chaplain to the Queen? And what does a chaplain to the Queen do? <laughs> uh, those, are, those are not simple questions because um, <laughs> the English establishment is a very mysterious thing. Uh, so being made a chaplain to the Queen is a bit like getting an MBE in, 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 in sort of real life. Uh, it doesn't, it, at one level, the, the Queen has so many chaplains, she doesn't know what to do with them. It's, it's an honour, essentially. It means um, if you get it early, it means you're probably going somewhere career-wise. If you get it late, it's a pat on the head 
for, you know, sorry, sorry, didn't quite make it in time. Um, I got it early, but but I was, it happened just at the moment when um, the whole wokeness was beginning. And, uh, and also a friend of mine who was a, who was a, a Muslim colleague uh, told me what the Islamic community was hoping for in terms of their role in Europe. And I was very surprised. So I began to talk about that and then discovered that um, both by combating uh, what we call wokery today and also talking about the implications of Islamic immigration, that put me on the wrong side of the establishment. And at that point, doors began to close very rapidly. And I, I, I had to choose between uh, speaking my mind uh, or, or um, uh, being embraced by the establishment. And I decided that I could only live with myself if I spoke my mind. That's, is that, that why you left? <clears throat> Yeah, to, yes, it, yeah. Yes. I had I had a phone call from uh, from the palace one day saying, um, <laughs> well, it, it had followed a, an assassination um, plot. The MI five had phoned the, the palace, telling them that uh, there was a, an intention to assassinate me on my way to to preach in one of the palaces, and so they said, well, you can't you can't do that. We the queen doesn't want blood on her carpet, and I, I said, well, you know, that's it goes with the turf. Actually, that's what it is to be a Christian. You you don't back off because people threaten you. But um, but but I got a phone call at some point a year or so later saying, look, if you continue to speak out in public, um, you can't represent the Queen. And that was quite true because the, the Queen can't act as a monarch if she's identified with political movements. So those people who work for her or are connected with her in any kind of way um, essentially have to be silent in the public space or else they jeopardise the independence and the mystique of monarchy. So I, I quite understood that. I, I accepted that immediately. Uh, and so, again, I had to choose whether I remained a royal chaplain and took a vow of silence or whether uh, I, I cheerfully resigned and said, I'm going to speak. Uh, well, I'm going, to finish, I'm going to answer questions when people ask me. It wasn't that I was uh, seeking attention by trying to make a fuss. Uh, I, I simply answered questions when journalists asked them to me, and that was enough to cause all the trouble. I want to ask you about your view on Justin Welby and the comments that he's made um, with regard to the Rwandan refugees, where he said that the plans were un ungodly. Um, do you think that he's being too political and do you think that that's a, a view that he should be putting out there? Christian has always had a lot of trouble balancing the spiritual and the political because they do bleed into each other, so to speak. Um, but we really ought to learn from history. Whenever Christianity has got political, it's failed. It, it doesn't work. That's not what it's supposed to do. Um, Jesus made it very clear. It really is all about heaven and hell and being reconciled by to God the Father, being forgiven and being changed and transformed. And then if you have a group of people in whom these things take place, people who turn the other cheek and love their enemies and love their neighbours as themselves, that's what changes society. Um, that, that's an extraordinarily exciting and dramatic way of infusing new life into a culture. So the politics follows the religious experience. If you do it the other way around and you try and pass laws to make people better or behave, or you criticize the government to try and get a better performance out of them, that always fails. Um, I mean, history teaches that in every single generation. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I don't want to be personal because it's, it, it's um, disrespectful to us all, but, but I'm, I'm surprised that, that, that he hasn't, hasn't been told that or doesn't know it, hasn't discovered it. Um, but it's not, it's certainly not on his, his radar. Yeah, well, it's, it seems that it doesn't seem to be. Um, and, and finally, I want to ask you, um, so what are you up to now? And in terms of where, where do you see yourself going and, on your journey? Well, yes, it's a crisis. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly dead. I'm in my late 60s, so I've only got one more lap to go. Uh, to, to my great surprise, um, I began to feel that only the Roman Catholic Church had the integrity and the um, and the DNA to resist what's happening. Um, that was partly because as I look through history, um, although of course the church has made all kinds of terrible mistakes, it's run by people, so it's bound to. Um, nonetheless, I thought that, that uh, the Reformation experiment was over. And um, as I looked at the Soviet, by the Soviet Union and China, I thought the Catholic Church has the integrity. So, uh, and I also then began to discover that what it taught was true. So I've become a Roman Catholic. And um, at the moment, it's not clear whether I'll be ordained as a priest or whether I shall 
go on simply writing and commentating. Uh, I want to do whatever's most effective. And inevitably, as every Christian says, I want to discover my vocation, which is what is that God wants. That's not always obvious. You don't usually get letters through the post. You have to work it out through prayer and waiting. So at the moment, I'm I'm simply planning to be as active as I as I can in the values of the church in order to share with other people some of the wonderful things that I've received at God's hands. And I think on receiving them can be shared to make a better society. Well, listen, Dr. Gavin Ashton, thank you so much for joining me. It's been lovely to talk to you.